Running fans, jumping fans, throwing fans, all around athletics fans, welcome to Talking and Ovals. How's everybody doing out there on this Thursday, December 28th of 2023? I am Alex Cuesta. My partner in crime over there is Dave Hyatt. What is going on, brother? Not much. It's, uh, you know, we just had some Christmas here. I just had my uh, daughters, first time I saw them since Christmas. So we just did a little gift unwrapping and it was a good time. I, uh, just found out that Flow Sports is going to be putting on the New Jersey sectionals, groups, and mid champs right on their app. So you don't even have to go to Mouse Split if you have Flow Sport. So that's that's pretty cool. Now let's hope the NJSIA participates and gives us a meet of champs we want to watch by scheduling it properly. And I have big news. I accepted a job as a high school English teacher at Manasquan High School. So I will be Woo-hoo. starting there in February. So I'm pumped. Yeah, back, and the myth. Back teaching high school and I don't know. I'm just and coaching. Confident. Teaching and coaching official. You're back to doing what you do, Hyatt. Yeah, no, you know, I mean it's good stuff. You know, I'll, I'll be helping out volunteer coaching over there at Manasquan and uh just just fun to, to get everything back on track and life is good, man. Absolutely. So for those keeping score at home, this is episode sixty eight. It's been a pretty wonky few weeks. Last time you heard from us, I believe, was December 11th. Um, and on that show, we had Meg Waldron on. Um, she is a she's a mental performance coach, and it was a really fun show talking to her about what she does in terms of dealing with the psyche of young high school collegiate athletes, working with coaches and things like that. So go back, give that show a listen. But it's been a little wonky. The holiday season, uh, has people been, yeah. getting sick, things like that. It was a little tough. That's why you haven't heard from us last week and then later this week with Christmas and stuff like that. So we're just getting a show in. Uh, we're trying to have some fun here, trying to give our you know our listeners. I know we have a uh, few faithful ones, and you know I appreciate we appreciate all you absolutely. And we're trying to give you guys something before we get into all the fun stuff. As always, give us a like, a share, a follow, subscribe, rate us five stars. Tell every single runner, thrower, jumper you know, and especially throwers and jumpers, we want more of you guys. We absolutely. haven't talked to a single really thrower. We talked to um, former throwers that now run an athletic facility. Um, and, you know, but we want to get some active ones. So please spread that word of mouth. Let them know. Come on this show. Uh, we would like it there. Go find us on the socials at Talking and Ovals. Just go look for us. You'll see our logo, the track with Talking and Ovals written in there. So we're going to have some fun this week. But before that, Hyatt, we need to chastise some people. Okay. We are friends with many a coach. We have had many a coach on here. And we know athletes. And we have not gotten a single PR. No, and we've not. Or has we got? And I know y'all out there are running PRs because that's what happens now, especially early season. Everyone just flows right into it. So we're going to start getting on some butts uh, because we want some PRs. You kids out there, you runners out there deserve recognition when you work hard. And that's what we want to do here. So we're going to start getting on that because people deserve to hear it. And this is our last show of the year, Dave. It is. Next time you'll hear from us. 2024. 2024 in January. So, um, like Dave said, Christmas was just happened. You know, hope everyone had a great Christmas. Absolutely. Hope everyone was safe, met, saw family and friends. And now I hope that, you know, you're going to have a happy new year coming up soon. So we're excited and we're going to do something a little different this week. We don't have a guest. We do not. It's just going to be Dave and I, but, you know, we can hold on the fort. We've done it yeah. just to before. And we're going to try and do something fun and interesting for you guys. Been a we while, can, but we can yeah, do it. We can do it. I think we can. So what we're going to do is Dave and I are going to go down basically our top five, some of our favorite runners, athletes, everything of all time. Probably give a little like why about like, you know, why we like them so much. And I think we're going to try and split it up all time. And then also ones that we watch. So it can, it's going to be a little different because Dave brought up a good point. It's kind of different from the favorites that we watch compete as opposed to the all time greats that we believe are all time greats, which the all time greats is really hard. Because I mean, there's, there's so, so many, many, you know, like, so like, like we're going to forget people like Jim Thorpe or Lasse Viren or, you know, like, like maybe even Jesse Owens, some of the absolute legends. But this is our list. 
This is who we watched and who we felt. And, you know, I'm going to uh, apologize now that my list is pretty uh, dominant on the distance side. Um, but that's who I was growing up. And, and that's yeah. who I uh, mostly watched compete. So there's a lot of distance runners on my list. So you're just going to have to deal with it. And mine, I think, is basically all Americans, maybe except for one, because that's kind of where I was. My wheelhouse was very much American centric. And I will say that track meets being on TV on ESPN and stuff, CBS, like really started to wane out as I got older. I feel like you had a lot more meets on the weekends to watch and things like that. Like, obviously, the marathons were on, but there was a good string there, Dave, where ESPN was having a good amount of meats on yeah, and, and it was, it was cool and that's see and nbc you know, and mean, that started to really wane as i was getting through my formative years so you really had to start searching for it yeah i mean and you know like i remember growing up now when you watch the uh, olympics they're on nbc they're on all these channels free i remember growing up we had to order the triple cast it was yeah. like the, the first time where you could watch every event in every race and it was awesome I mean, it was like it was like a hundred bucks then but they had like different sports on at like different times you, you could just go to track it was cool yeah that's that's a that's pretty cool so we're gonna start this up so dave i think we should start with our favorites because okay. i feel like that might be a little bit easier to navigate yeah. and then we'll get down the nitty-gritty and we'll then we'll start getting some hate mail about our i have about 20 people on my uh, list i i just added some as we were getting set 20. up so i have some honorable mention so i have top five in each, I have top five favorites, top five all time. Then I have a bunch of honorable mentions. Um, so do you want to go over some of your honorable mentions first? Uh, yeah. I mean, we can go over guys that I that I love, but or that I respected. Uh, all right. I think. Jeez. I mean, oh, I think I'm gonna go with Alan Webb first. I have um, Alan Webb in there as well. That's one of my honorable mention guys. I mean. What he did at his age, I, mean, I remember when he ran 353 and he was on Letterman, you know, like at the mile, and, and then he went on and broke the U.S. national record at 346. He was just an, an icon. I mean, he was a little older, a little younger than I was, but I remember watching him and Nathan Ritzenheim and Ryan Hall in high school. And I mean, Al Webb was just, he was the guy, like, you know, he was making millions of dollars, you know right out of his freshman year of college. And, you know, he was a part of a great book called sub four by Chris Lear. So, I mean, he's definitely one of my honorable mentions. One of my honorable mentions is someone who's a fairly recent guy and it's Usain Bolt. And I think Usain Bolt can easily fit on the top five all time list. Um, And I would be fair if you put him on there, but uh, I think it's, you know, Dave and I are both a little more distance centric, but Usain Bolt is one of my honorable mentions because absolutely. Just the way he came onto the scene. I mean, it was at a time where you had guys like Asafa Powell and things like that that were already dominating and really competing hard for Jamaica. And we thought we were seeing the pinnacle with the him and Tyson Gay going at it. And Justin Gatlin. Justin Gatlin and all these people. And then all of a sudden, here comes this six foot forever string bean guy, not really great form for a you know short sprinter. And we heard some hype, right? He was U20 record holder in the 200 meter well, and things like yeah. that. And we were, and, but we've seen that before. We've seen these great young athletes do the U20 thing, come out, be good pros, but not great, right? And then you say Big Bull comes on and starts beating people and beats him again and over and over. And then he gets to the Olympics, does the Olympic double, gets back to the Olympics, back to back world records and Olympic oh, double. And it, it just, ridiculous and you know his 958 and 1919 uh, the 958 i think will get broken the 1919 i don't think is going to get touched i think it's the other way i'd see i think the 1919 is faster uh i mean they're both really fast they're both ridiculous but basing off of this year it definitely seemed like the 1919 was closer than 100 i mean not that it was close maybe a couple 193s here there yeah high point but um i mean yeah i mean Usain Bolt is the one guy that we we had tracked that we could actually talk to normal civilians about and that they would actually know who he was. You know, he was on the, the, the ESPN commercials like he he definitely marketed himself very, very well. And he was great. The charisma and also and uh, you know what USATF or even, you know, not USATF uh, World Athletics. The man wants to be an ambassador. Can we please please? How would you not bring him back? I mean, and I don't put him in commercials again. What are we doing? 
he should be marketing every single Diamond League meet. Him and every Michael Johnson one. should both be in a commercial together. Absolutely. So that's one of it's my honorable Noah mentions. Lyles. With Noah. Yeah. And All they right, could well, be like having like a fake race. My <laughs> next honorable mention, you mentioned um, how we often hear about these stud high school kids. Yeah. Um, and one of my honorable mention is one of those who never made it. But some of the most impressive running that I've ever seen was this guy and his teammates at Penn Relay. And that's Obi Moore. Yep. Obi Moore came out and ran like 45, 44 point in high school. He was the next thing, you know, he was going to run a 142. He was going to run sub 43. And then, um, you know, he made some poor choices in life. And, you know, it, it, it never panned out for him. You know, I saw a d- documentary on Flow Sports called Whatever Happened to Obi Moore. And it, w- it was really good. It, it talks about, you know, like things just, just didn't work out. But I remember him and his boys from your high school in California coming to Penn Relays and running like 308, 310. Like it was just, it was just unbelievable. Obi Moore was just one of those guys that I thought was canvas. Him and Michael Granville, who ran a 146 in the high school to, to get the record and then went to UCLA. It, it was just a, a shame. And, you know, it, it, it just makes you wonder, can you run too much at a young age where it can affect you? I, I think, you, you know, my life, I'm not sure. I, I think training is better now, but at, at at that point, you just weren't seeing kids run that fast. So it was it was just amazing, and he was just an absolute juggernaut when uh, he was in high school. Yeah, absolutely, he was a monster, and he's someone that you hear stories about, right? If you're you're especially if you're like a 400 meter runner and stuff, you know that name, and he's kind of a cautionary tale about don't get too ahead of yourself, right? Um, just because you're doing great things now, continue to try and be great and well, you know, make good decisions, and you know do. He that was also. Stuff fighting he was running for a high school but he was running for his club coach and it was yeah, just a, a yeah. lot of like i don't want you running this me you know it, he was kind of torn in, in a bunch of places and where you know, kids I'm, shouldn't be i'm sure some of it is on him too but uh, a lot of it was on those people who were supposed to be looking out for him and it's kind of a shame it certainly is so i'll go on to my next honorable mention um bernard lagat bernard lagat's a guy that i mean he was a, he was a great kenyan runner an amazing kenyan runner already and then Someone that appreciated everything that and, and don't and listen, and it's not like one of those guys that like couldn't break through with the African runners and he was their lead runner for years, you know, a champion for them and decided that he loved what America brought him and all the training and all the opportunity and being here and decided to become a citizen and switched to run for the United States. And that was at the time where I want to say. African middle distance running and distance running in general was at its peak where I it was, he actually missed an Olympics while he was going through the yeah, he did. citizenship. He did. And, you know, and it was the it was the Kenyans, the Ethiopians, the Moroccans, and they were just all the dominant. Right. And then Bernard Lagat was the shining light for America that was always just mixing it up. And I just remember watching so many epic races from the 1500 all the way to the 10K with Bernard Lagat. And just you didn't see the African nations strategizing for an American like they did against Bernard Lagat. I remember just watching races where you had guys sacrificing winning races just to box Bernard Lagat out. It was the most ridiculous thing I've saw. And, well, you know, the- he would just fight through it, get through a box out and try to go win. And just watching him was inspiring well, because he knew what yeah. he was doing. He knew when he went from, you know, being a part of the African nations to an American, he was going to get a target on his back. And he was more than willing to do it. And in a short period of time as an American, you know, competing, he was he is one of the greatest middle distance runners and distance runners in American history. So I love Bernard Lagarde. I remember him having battles with Hisham. Yep. He would usually come up just a short, but I mean, he ran a 326, you know, he ran an American record in the 15 5K. You know, he he was just he was a a legend and talk about a very just like a humble. seems like an amazing guy. You know, and I mean, just just think about everything that he had to overcome and just always had a smile on his face. And uh, one of my absolute all time favorites. Yes, without a doubt. So why don't we do one more honorable mention each and then we'll get into the nitty gritty of our lists. Yeah, I mean, my geez, I have so so many. I think I'm going to go (laughs) with my last honorable mention. I'm going to go with. uh, Three field guys, I'm just going to throw them on there. I. A guy that that many people might not have known was Lawrence Johnson. He was a pole vaulter at the University of 
Tennessee. He had flash. He had flair. He was just oh. fun. He was just a stud. He was very athletic. So he was one of my favorites. Um, Sergey Bubka, come on. I mean, he was Mondo B for Mondo, an absolute monster. Um, yep. And my last one, I used to love to watch John Godina because he was one of my favorite guys because he actually threw the shot and discus. He competed in both um, at a very high level. And I just thought that that was really, really cool that he was because, you know, like you had Adam Nelson yeah. shot, but you had John Godina, but it was cool how Godina would just do both. And, you know, it kind of brought me back to that high school teammate or that college teammate, you know, who, who was that good where he where he could throw both. So those are three guys that on the field side that that I, I really enjoyed watching compete. Since you did three, I'm going to do three and cheat as well real quick. And my three are going to be all the ladies. Um, I got to give Allison Felix a shout out. She okay. deserves a spot. She's one of the greatest, if not the greatest American sprinter. Um, Sydney McLaughlin is quickly coming up on that title. Sydney McLaughlin, Lavoni. But Allison Felix, I think, still holds that crown for now. She's not the world record holder that Sydney is, but it just in terms of impact on the American teams, the, the, the Olympic longevity. teams and the longevity and the fact that she just wrapped it up a little over a year ago is absolutely insane. I feel like I was watching her quite literally my whole life. So and I I loved how she was proven. Hey, yeah, I have a family and kids. I'm a, a mom, but just because I have a kid doesn't mean that I can't come back and kick your ass. Her swag and her moxie or something. And her, and she did it with the most disarming smile you'll ever see because she was such a cheery looking person. But when she got on that track and her face got serious, it was all it was no games anymore. So she's one. And I mentioned Sydney. I'm going to put Sydney McLaughlin, Lavoni and a thing Mo together. Um, they've done and, you know, I have chastised them on this podcast. I have given them shit. But there is. No doubt that those two are two of my favorite individuals to watch compete. And that is why I chastise them so much because the fan in me wants to see them compete at every friggin' meet that I can. So I'm putting them both as honorable mentions because I think before it's all said and done, they will sneak onto my top five ever favorite watching, you know, but they're still young in their careers. I still want to see more of them. So they're my honorable mentions. And man, we left out so many names, right? We left out like, you're, uh, you know, for me, uh, Wilson Kipkater, David Radisha, Emmy Co Emma Coburn, like so many names we left out that are on my list, but Inger Britson, Inger Britson. Yeah. So I want to jump in. Well, so I just have to give a, you know, like, and Robbie, Robbie Andrews. I got to go. I got He's up there, but I mean, there's a few people that might have been on this list, but I couldn't add him like a uh, Marion Jones, a Justin Gatlin, Flo like, uh, people who I loved watching Flo Joe, you know, but like yeah. you just, you don't know. I mean. Flojo is different because like there was never anything concrete. Well, we know per se. I mean, I, even, I have even learned. Tyson Gay, Tyson Gay, like Tyson another Gay. one where yeah, you just, know, I mean, that there, there's a lot of people, you know, more your screen and yeah, and Mo was an honorable mention down there too. Noah Lyles was one of my honorable mentions that I could have said, but there's so many names, and I think it's great now that we have, we're going through a golden era of American track, especially. Oh, so all these names are up there, but let's start. Steve A. Smith Who, would say this is a fluid list. A fluid list. So, who is your number five on your all time or uh, your fa top five favorite athletes that you've watched compete? That I've watched. Remember, this is very um, distance biased. I yep. apologize for that. Number five is probably going to be Ale Gabriselesi. Gabriselesi is a monster. He so he just kind of changed everything. He shattered every record in cross country and track, and he was just. An absolute monster. I loved watching him run. Um, he always like wasn't afraid to just take it and run fast. And he, he was just an absolute, you know, he was like this little guy from me. He'll be tiny, small, but he was just absolutely unbelievable. He he certainly was. Gabo Lacey was amazing. And it's funny because as you hear on this list, you're going to hear the difference between Dave, who definitely is much more distance oriented, and me, who enjoyed the track a lot more like I was more of a track guy I like cross country but I was more of a track guy so my fifth guy is someone who you've heard on the show before Kadivis Robinson um he was one of the people that inspired me to be a middle distance runner I mean he's a sub 144 guy uh ran 143 six, eight. never broke through with an Olympic medal but he was an Olympian he was competitive at worlds and just 
watching him and you know you mentioned the longevity with Allison Felix, Khadivas Robinson had incredible longevity in Absolutely. the sport too, running, you know, into his forties at a elite level. So Khadivas is my number five uh I've ever watched. So Dave, who's your number four? Keeping along with those lines, Bekele. Can you say Bekele? Yes. I mean, he kind of came around right after Gabor Salisian kind of said, all right, you have every record. I'm going to shatter every single one of them. Quite literally torch passing. <laughs> and yeah, it was just like, all right, Ali's like, I'm done. I'm going to bump up. Here you go. Five, 10 K. And he went out and shattered. And you know, I think he might've been the first guy under 27. Yep. And like 1240 something. Like, it was just like <laughs> running times that were like, how is this humanly possible? But like, you know, and just watching him just dominate. He was absolutely into guy was like five foot one, like hundred pounds, but just was an absolute monster. So Bekele is absolutely one of my all time favorites. So one of the most memorable people on this list, my number four is a woman, which I know is surprising, but we mentioned Allison Felix with all of her longevity. This woman was incredible from, I have a guess. Early from the late 1980s to up to 2000, like early 2000s, Gail Devers. Loved her. And my favorite memory of Gail Devers, I think the one that people will remember her by more than her prowess on the track, was her nails. Fingernails her nails awesome. were always so wrapped around and they were, they were crazy. And I just remember just watching her set up and curious how she never broke them on the start, right? Because sprinters are down there. But outside of that, just talking about her accomplishments, three time Olympic champion, you know, back to back. 100 meter champion in the Olympics from 92 to 96, winning it in America, which is even better. That Atlanta won in 96 was incredible. And again, one of my first memories of watching track. 92, a little fuzzy. I was four. But then 96 comes around, eight years old. I'm much more aware. I thoroughly remember her winning there. And then world championships. He's a five time gold medalist there, three time silver medalist, indoor champion, dominant with four golds. And just so much to go on. And Gail is just. What I love, though, is it wasn't just the 100. Yeah, no. She was Hurdles. good. She was a great her 100-meter hurdler. Yep. She would have won, I don't know if it was the uh, Olympics or Worlds, but but she like fell over the last hurdle. I mean, just the fact that, that she could be world-class in both events. like like, And she was, know, because see, she was yeah. the champion in 93, 95, 99 uh, for the 100-meter hurdles in Worlds. So yeah. not the Olympics, but Worlds. She's still a world champion in those events, so... Yeah, it's she was everything you want in a short sprinter. I still love her Gildy. and Gwen Torrance. For, Gwen was, Torrance was, was, was it, another. Uh, they, yes. they were just so much fun to watch. I mean, yeah. wow. So Gail comes in at four for me. She's a good one, man. Who's your number three? Three? Yep. Is going to be Mr. Gold Shoes himself, Michael Johnson. Yes, it's a good I one. I mean, 1996 was, I mean, he was great in the late 80s. 92, I think that's when he still has the world record. He split like 42.4 by four. He was just a machine. Like he didn't lose the 200 or the 400. I know he lost that fluky 150, up, you know, against Adam and Bailey. But I mean, the, he was just pure money and he just stood up so, so straight. And he was, he had that Baylor pedigree. He Reinvented just, form. Nobody, when he was coming out, his yeah, was, form was middle distance form. It was, it was very correct. He very, wasn't very straight up, very yeah. erect. Yep. He ran like an 800 meter runner and it <clears> just <throat> worked. And he reinvented everything that people thought about sprinting for him. Ah, oh, unreal. It, and, you know, like he just didn't, he didn't lose. No, it was just that drive to win and, you know, world record holder, obviously, in the 400 to 200. So, you know, four by four, four by four. And, you know, with Manchester's finest, Andrew Valman still being a part of that four by four team. Yeah. But, um, Andrew, we're coming after you. you're coming on the show, whether you like it or not. That's but that just think about the balls it takes and the absolute confidence. Yeah. I'm going to rock these gold shoes. Yeah. And I'm going to win with these gold shoes. Like yeah. I just let like in. 96, you know, home turf in at Atlanta. It was just, ah, it was so much fun to watch. He's the type of guy that you want. I would love to see him and Michael Norman just line up against each other. Uh, I think Michael Johnson would wipe the floor with him, but I think it will be, it depends on which Michael Norman we're seeing. If it's a world's Michael Norman, we just saw, I don't know, man, it will be competitive, but it's, you know, these are, that's one of those, what if things. So that's an amazing one. Obviously one of the top, 
five sprinters of all time, uh, Michael Johnson. So that's a great pick. So my number three is I consider the, this person to be the best athlete in the history of running, of, of just athletics. Ashton best Neaton. athlete, huh? Best athlete, uh, Ashton well, Eaton. Well, yeah. um, the decathlete to me, every year, your decathlete gold medalist is the best athlete in the world. Um, they just, they're the top at 10 different events through, was it two days, three days they compete? Two days? Yeah. Two, two days, two. which is grueling. He had, I think he's still, does he still have the world record or did it get broken? Uh, I, th- hmm. I don't know. But he was the second decathlete to break the 9,000 point barrier. And he is, he's incredible. He's a two time gold medalist um, in 2012, 2016 Olympic Games, two time world champion, 2013, 2015, indoors in the HEP three times. It's just incredible guy. And we don't give enough credit to our decathletes. Um, and Ashton Eaton was just so much fun to watch. And uh, he was. And my thing, Phenomenal. I think what sold it with me is he was a great 1500 meter runner, like a really good 1500 meter guy. And you didn't see that from your decathlete. It's like really fast, like yeah. sub four. And it's pretty, it's ridiculous how fast he was. So I love it. Ashton's my number three. Who's All your right. two? My two, another distance runner. <laughs> Surprise. Uh, wait. So, so far I have. Gabasalisi, Bekele, Johnson. I'm gonna have two tied at my number two spot because I'm. I'll take it because I'm like that. I got <laughs> Nordy Morsley and he okay. shot El, El Garouche. I love it. They were like, they were just both like absolutely amazing. I mean, we start off with with the Algerian best Nordy Morsley with PRs of 144. 327, 344. He ran a 1303. He was El Garouge before. El Garouge just shattered everyone. Mile 1500. I mean, he was just unreal. I mean, when when he ran a 344, I was like, this is not going to be broken anytime yeah. soon. Crazy. I mean, he was just so much fun to watch. I, I yeah. just love my, my, myself some more. And then, I mean, Hisham El Garouge. I'm not sure if you'll find a better 5,000. 1500 guy in the history of our sport. I mean, dude ran a, what, a 343 flat, some of that, a 326 flat. I'm sure he was under 13, 5K. Just, you know, but like, kind of like Ingerbritsen in a sense, like he had some struggles on the big stage. It was almost, you know, like that, that competitive actual race was, was harder for him. You know, he, he was better kind of like Ingerbritsen where, goes out fast and he can just con- con- control the pace and go. And he just battled with um, your guy, Bernard, all the time. It was amazing. I mean, he, but he's Sham. Love him. He's my number two. And it's interesting because he's actually my number two all time guy. <laughs> so I'll talk about him a little more there. You know, we'll kind of go over a little more because uh, we'll talk. I just want to talk about him more later. But I'll go to my number two. And I watched Jeremy Warner. Jeremy Warner was a 400 meter stud and it feels like it was a blip. Even though Jeremy Warner did have longevity, it felt so fast that he was on top. And it was one of those things. He always wore the Oakley sunglasses, the very high tint Oakley sunglasses. And there's a rule in running. If you're going to rock sunglasses, you better go win. And the one thing about Jeremy Warner is he didn't lose. I mean, he has, I think he's a 43 second guy. What was his PR? It was, he was in the 43s. Um, oh, yeah. Hands down. Absolutely. Yeah. So he, his P, PR is 43, four, five. Yeah. He's a multiple world champ. I'm sure he won the, the, the Olympics. He won the Olympics in 2004 in the 400 open. And then in 04 and 08 on the four by four, taking uh, second in Beijing in 08. He's a um, one, two, two time world champion in the 400 and 05 and 07, four by four multiple times. I mean, the guy was just so much fun to watch. And it was just the way he ran it. It was so fluid. He did not look like he was trying. When Jeremy Warner was running, it was just, you did, you wanted to watch it. It was poetry on the track. And I just remember being a young guy looking at it and, you know, a guy that had wheels myself, just being inspired watching him run. It was just so much fun. And 
the confidence that he had. He carried himself like a guy that knew he was going to win every time he got on the track. So love me some Jeremy Warner. I think people forget that the late 80s through a lot of the 2000s, if you were a stud 400 meter runner, you went to Baylor and you ran under clad heart. Like, yep. I mean, Baylor was the place to go. It was a factory for 400 meter runners. Clad Hart was factory. a phenomenal yeah. coach, you know, but I mean, that's just where people went to uh, run a fast four. Yeah. Yeah. So what is your uh, number one all time favorite athlete to watch compete? All right. This is people are not going to agree with this, but it's my list. So <laughs> I don't care. I was a American distance runner in the 90s. And there was one guy who I absolutely always looked up for. Never really had a chance of winning any race because of the Kenyans and the Ethiopians. But Bob Kennedy was my guy, man. He was my guy. Listen, so many generations. He when he American ran twelve fifty eight and he broke thirteen minutes as an American, it was a big deal. It was absolutely tremendous. I loved him. I love Todd Williams, but I got to give uh, Bob the, the edge. It just because he put out there, he was not afraid to race anybody, and he got down to under thirteen minutes. So Bob Bob Kennedy was just my absolute favorite runner to watch of all time that I watch with my own eyes. See, I never got to see Bob Kennedy until he was like an older guy and he was still competing late in age and he was still fast. The one thing about Bob Kennedy that I know, though, there is always a question. Who's the next pre, right? That's always been a big thing. There could be an argument to be made that Bob Kennedy filled those shoes because he inspired so many American distance runners to just. And like you said, that moxie, he had a very similar moxie to pre where he wasn't scared and he showed he wasn't scared. He would get in the lead of races, no problem, Like, and really mix it up and had a lot of success in his career. Like you said, sub-13, which I, I, was like, unheard and like, of like, at the time. He would go train with the Africans. You know, yeah. like He was trying to progress the sport because he realized, like, we can't keep doing what we're doing here in America. We have to expand. We, yeah. we have to go out. So he, he kind of made it so that, like, you saw yourself that you could do this as a profession if – if you're going to, I just love Bob. He was absolutely just, I loved him in college run at Indiana. Yeah. You know, like he, he was just, he was just fun and he was fast and he was my guy. Yeah. Bob Kennedy is someone again, like I said, I didn't get to see him tr run much, but I had his poster on my wall because if you were a middle we distance runner, poster. you had his poster. Dang. Absolutely. Free and Bob Kennedy were the two posters everybody had. So my favorite top guy, is going to be no surprise to anyone my generation. Nick Simmons was my favorite guy to watch compete. Now, Nick it does not have all the accolades that so many guys has. Um, He's a 142 guy. But he was a 142 guy. He's a silver medalist in the world championships over in 20, 2013 in Moscow. And for me, it was the way he ran. I was a sit and kick guy. That was very much my style. And you were always told, especially in high school, like it works in high school, maybe a little bit in college. Once you, if you want to get to the higher level, got to learn how to compete. And at the time, we were going from the Johnny Moore, the Cadivas Robinson style of run up front, be competitive. And that's the best way to compete internationally. And it was successful. Johnny's amazing. Cadivas was great. Um, and even Dwayne Solomon came from that same school and had success, right? Nick was different. Nick was a D3 kid, went to Williamette University in Oregon, a four-time national champion in both the 15 and 800 meter, and just a phenom in the D3 level that you really didn't hear of until all of a sudden, here he comes beating your Cadivas Robinsons, beating your guys that were well-known, onto being the guy that held the torch, I want to say for uh, at least an Olympics or two. He had a solid five-year run, and I think Nick would have had a longer run if he didn't hate the system. He was a guy that fought the system, you know, wanted to get athlete sponsorships, did the henna tattoo, got in trouble for that, um, and is someone that is now making a ridiculously good career on YouTube, YouTube, doing a lot of like lifting things. He's always been a gym junkie, but the inspiration of watching him get out and dead last while everyone else is out running a 49.50, he's running a 53, to come back and win a race in a 144. So it was it was ridiculous to watch, but you always knew when Nick Simmons was in a race, it didn't matter where he was. By the end of the race, you will see him with ridiculously bad form going like a bat out of hell for 100 meters, 
whether he won or not, who knew, but it was always exciting. And I love watching Nick Simmons compete. Him and Robbie were very similar in that sense. Yeah. Yeah, they were. I, Robbie. I, and the thing is, Robbie, I think, had more top end speed than Nick Simmons. I, Nick Simmons I, just I, balls. Yeah. <laughs> it really was just. And um, Robbie obviously had a lot of balls. The guy's amazing runner. We love Robbie Andrews here. But um, it was just something about the way Nick did. It was just it was different. It was different, and for a time, I think it was one of the more exciting things Americans had to look forward to every single year in the 800. It wasn't the Bowerman Mile that took the show for a few years. It was Nick Simmons running the eight, which is weird, over in Oregon, and he was an Oregon favorite. So that's my favorite guy to watch. So now... you know, And and, and I still think that I'm probably for getting guys, but... 100%. Yeah. Absolutely for getting guys. (laughs) But So let's go to our our five all-time legends. Now... I'm not putting this in a list of who I think is the all-time greatest. These are my five favorite legends. So these might be a little different than people. These are my five favorite. We can go on who the all-time greatest is. And like you said, you mentioned Jesse Owens. There's a case that even though Jesse Owens doesn't have all these records, could be the all-time greatest. There's so many cases for so many different athletes. I'm giving it more as my favorite five legends that, you know, as a runner, as an athlete, I looked up to. So... However you want to do it, we might have a different style of our list, but let's go with yours. Who's number five? Ingrid Britson. Ooh, already on the all-time list. Yeah, I, I just think he's that, that. He's young. I debated this. Um, dude's just special, man. Like like after this year, like he's just, I don't know. There's just something about him. Talk about moxie and confidence and... Yeah. Just not being afraid, you know. I mean, he he definitely has to clean up his worlds and his Olympics in the fifteen. He he seems to have it figured out five k. But I mean, dude's twenty three, and he's just like, I think he's gonna have every record by the time that that he's done. He he's just, I don't. I mean, he is young, and I debate about. I'm like, man, he 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 gave me so much joy this past year watching him run. Like every race, I would text you like, see that world record. Yeah. World record, world record, world record. So I think Inger Bitson is already one of the uh, greats. And I think by the time he's done, he's just someone that I, I just love to watch run. I love to watch him compete. As long as he keeps pushing guys like Nagoose and, you know, what, Woody Kincaid, go get on his shoulder in the 5K. Let's go get an American record there, too. But, um, yeah, no, you know, Fisher and everyone like and there's so many good Americans. But, yeah, Inger Britson is... I think he deserves, and that's a great one to throw on there. So my number five is Jim Ryan. Jim Ryan's a guy I never got to watch compete. And it's still, when you're growing up, it's not only someone that runners talked about. Everybody talked about Jim Ryan. Now, it helped that he was a congressman for a little bit. But no one remembers him as a congressman. Everyone remembers what he did as a runner. And It's like Bill Bradley as a senator. Exactly. And it's like growing up, You know, even at the time where I was, track was not popular, but everybody knew who Jim Ryan was. Everyone, Jim Ryan was somebody, he was one of the last people that I think, you know, you know, there was, there was been athletes out of grace, uh, sports illustrated covers and things like that, that are runners, but it's like Jim Ryan was a national phenomenon. Jim Ryan was the first ever high schooler to break four minutes in a mile, which was absolutely insane. He had multiple American records before they were broken and just a really inspiring guy and someone that you knew who he was. You knew growing up and he's my number five all time. So what's your four? Uh, Four is a man that I honestly watched and said, I don't know if anybody will ever be better than this person that I'm watching. And that's hard because, you know, like people get get faster at time. But yeah, I'm not sure. We'll ever see anybody as dominant in an event as David Radisha was in the oh, God. That guy was just special. I mean, just the fact to say that he ran a 140 and like he showed up and he was not one of those, oh, it's a championship race. Let me take it out slow. Yeah. I'm gonna bust your ass from the gun. Come and get me. <laughs> and they couldn't. That's what I think separates him from Kip Keeter is that he went out and he dominated. Yeah. in big races and he won i just thought that he was just this freak guy who was like just you couldn't take it out and beat him you couldn't take it out slow and, and beat him like he was just he had that event on lockdown and it was one of the most impressive things that i've ever seen 
And the thing is, it was like talking to Robbie and like having him like talk to us about what it was like just being in David Rudisha's presence and like competing against him is like we had a guy, he ran sub 141. I didn't think any I thought Wilson Keep Keeter, yes, he wasn't great in the big stage. He was awesome. Keep Keeter was as close as you could get to getting there. The 141s, I think he did it like three times. He ran insane. like 141 like three, four times, which I didn't think at the time. It was like, all right, Wilson Keep Keeter. We'll see for a little while. People will get close. And and then David Rudisha comes on his back, quite literally on his back. Oh, yeah. And just starts destroying it. And running one sub-142 or 142 was just automatic for him. And it's so bizarre. And But like you said, it was at the Olympic Games, at the World Championships, he dominated. And I just looked it up. And one thing that I might actually hate about him is he's only a month younger than me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like the, he's doing all these things in the event that I called my own and he's a month younger than me. Good job, David Rudisha. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like he, he left early, you know, but like he, he was just, top. yeah, he's like, all right, I'm done. Just so down. All right. You, you know, right. my number four is another one of our former guests, Johnny Gray. Um, Johnny Gray is, Again, you start looking up things, and obviously Donovan Brazier has the American record now. But when you're a middle distance runner, what do you do? You look up the American records, you look up the um, uh, world records, and you look up some of the fastest times. And consistently in the 800, you're kind of looking at it going, oh, a lot of, the, okay, Johnny Gray is there. And then the 600, Johnny Gray is the world best, at, you know, one of the world, like, not technically a world record, but the 600 is not often run. <laughs> and you have, and then you look and it's Johnny Gray is just everywhere. The thousand, the 217. Like Johnny Gray is Johnny somebody Gray's that, at running a 145 at like 57 years old. Yeah. <laughs> like the guy was just a machine, just a machine and a monster. 142 six. And what a great American guest. Record. What a humble guy. Oh my goodness. An amazing individual. If you haven't gone back and listened to the episode, please do. But just again, another all time great and somebody that, like I said, I, used to go and just look at his name back like, johnny gray who who's this johnny gray and then youtube became a thing and it's like oh that's johnny gray <laughs> like you would just go look up some of the races and it's like just a fierce individual uh like dave said an amazing guest an amazing person so that is my number four who is your three dave my three is a woman who talk about longevity she actually had some of her best races when she came back in the late 90s, we're talking about Mary Decker Slaney. Yes. I mean, she was amazing from like the age 10. She was running ridiculous times. Um, you know, everyone knows that she got tripped up by Zola Bud, um, you know, and people like, you know, there's a lot of controversy about that. But I mean, it's funny because I didn't really start watching her until she made her comeback in the 90s and was still running phenomenal. Yeah. Times, you know, I mean, there, there is some controversy about possible doping, but I don't know. I mean, she's she's run a 156. She's run a 416 mile, 1506 5K, 31, 35, 10K. She was just an absolute legend and multiple fact, world time world champion. Yeah, Olympic just, champion, but world champion, which is just the fact great. that as a woman that like she could hold on for that long and make a comeback. I yeah. mean, it, she was just an absolute joy to watch. And she was. Mary Kane and then turned into a great runner, you know, like she had all that pressure as a kid and then was able to withstand it, take a break, come back and still dominate. So I got Mary Slaney up there. Yeah, that's a great one. Um, so my number three is somebody that, you know, I looked up to and he was one of the most famous individuals to ever grace a Wheaties box. Now goes by Caitlyn Jenner. Then when he was a world champion, Bruce Jenner. And now he's my other, I have another decathlete. They both slot in the three spots. But although Ashton Eaton is obviously the superior, um, you know, decathlete in terms of results, Bruce Jenner was larger than life um, when he was around. And somebody that it's very rare. You don't have many track athletes that go across sports and pop culture like Bruce Jenner did. He was somebody that it didn't matter what sport you were in. You wanted to be like Bruce Jenner. You wanted to compete like he did because he dominated the Olympics when he went and he won. So he was somebody that was just extremely fierce, incredible. And, you know, he set a world Olympic world record when he won. So it was just someone that, again, growing up, looking at it, 
everyone knew who Bruce Jenner was. And it was somebody that, again, as a kid, you look him up, you see the amazing things that he did. So he is my number three. Right. I mean, I mean, you know, like kids now, they only know him for a completely different reasons for becoming I mean, Caitlyn Jenner. And, but, and you know, it's not disrespecting by calling him Bruce. I'm acknowledging who he was at the time yeah. when he was doing this. Cause Caitlyn Jenner didn't set those records. Bruce Jenner did. Yeah. And you know, God, hey, she's happy. God bless her. Happy for her. Whatever Caitlyn wants to do, Caitlyn could do. Yeah. But, um, ah, oh, absolute stud. Yeah. Absolute awesome. stud. Are we on what? Number two? We're on number two. Yep. All right. I mentioned a guy that you already mentioned, and you should know this from how much of a geek and a nerd that I was when we had him on our get on our show. And that is Johnny Gray. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you kind of hit the uh, nail on the head, just the, the longevity and the year after year of putting out sub 145s every year. I mean, he was just, there was nothing better than watching him run with that Santa Monica track club shirt. Yep. He was on that team. Carl Lewis was on that team. That's Mitchell. Like it was just so much fun to watch them run and compete at the national and at the world level. It was, he was great. Now it's interesting because my number two is uh Hikam El Garuch. Now, it's interesting because I knew about Hikam El Garuch. I looked him up plenty of times. It's like I had blinders on when I was watching him compete. Because obviously I knew he was running against Bernard Lacotte, but it's like I don't remember watching him compete. And I was aware in the 2000s and the 90, late 90s. But it's like he seems like he was an older time. Like, you know, like for me, like it yeah. doesn't seem like he was competing then. And now as I look back at it, and even though I watch him, he's still, to me, my second all-time great. Because like you said... The things and his his mile record is incredible. And I do I think it's going to be broken? Yes. I think there's two people that are going to break it. I think both Inger Britson and Nagus have a shot at both breaking it. Um, and, you know, because we've seen them being very fit and they almost broke the, five, the 15. I think they're going to go after the 1600 this year and they both have a good chance at getting it. But just it, insane. 343. That is so just so people realize running a 343 is running 17 miles per hour for a mile the whole time. Yeah. 17 miles per hour. See if you can sprint 17 miles per hour right now for a block, for a block, for a whole block. Try and hold 17 miles per hour. He did it for a full mile. And the thing that was impressive when he came out, Garuch was on, there was nobody near him. And that's how good he was at the time. Now, now you have guys that can compete a little more, but still, when performances like that come out, it is damn near impossible. So it's he's a great, a great individual runner. Uh, he's up there as for me as my number two guy. So I think we might agree on number one. Listen, I think it's it's pretty um, obvious. Um, someone of our of our age. Running distance races yep. came out with two movies about this guy. Documentary with fire on the track. Well, fire on the track came up first, and, and then we had a you know without way, limits. Prefontaine. Who was your favorite? Um, Prefontaine. Did you like Billy Crudup? Crudup. Yeah, I like Billy Crudup better than Jared, Jared Leto. And I'm a huge Jared Leto fan. I love Thirty Seconds to Mars, and but I thought Billy I Crudup thought... portrayed him better. Uh, see, I thought Leto might have been better as pre, but Without Limits was the better movie. I both also, really I, I also know for a fact that was great that both of them became really good runners because a lot of the scenes that they did, they obviously weren't running the races, but they were right. running on the track to get these films. So, yeah, you know, kudos to both of those guys. And you know, you know, like you just love his moxie, his fight. Yeah. Against amateurship, you know, um, just and I think the big reason why people have such an affinity for him is the what if. Yeah, hundred percent. Don't know. You don't know, and it was interesting. He could have gone to seventy four Olympics and finished in the same exact place that he was because he still had you know Veer and 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 those guys, or he could have won. But you know that he was going to take and go for it. So I think the whole what if, you know, his tragic death. I I I think that's why he has such. A mystique, and you know, for some reason, he, he was chosen to to be out there for our generation with the movies and the fire on, you know, the fire on the track. So, like, he was kind of brought into our generation, and he was mainstreamed. So, I think that that 
really helped. But I mean, he was my guy, and I never saw him run any race. Obviously, live he was dead before I was born. But just his mystique and and his aura. I mean, who didn't want to run for Oregon or Bowerman or Dellinger? You know, but like he was just the guy. Yeah, he was. He was the guy, and like go YouTube some Steve Prefontaine races and even his interviews. He was just such an interesting guy. And I, the one thing I do love about both Crud Up and Leto is they both got that interesting, quirky way that pre talked and the way that he did things. I think they both got that pretty well down. Um, yeah, but he was the first ever person to run in, to compete in Nikes. Yeah. Yeah. And he had the, you know, the waffle racers that. Yeah. Bowerman was making himself and you have to believe that one of the biggest regrets of Bowerman was not letting pre go out and run his race in the Olympics because the winning time was significantly slower than the American than the trials. Now, this isn't saying that Viren wouldn't have matched it, that Viren still wouldn't have beat him because the class of that race was one of the best 5Ks you will ever see in terms of class um, just with, you know, the British men and the Spanish. Like they were really good guys at all. There was probably four of them that could have won that race. And you see it in the way that they finish. Like it was just such a high level race, but yeah, the what if of pre, but it was also, I think it's the what if, but also living up to hype. I think yeah. we appreciate people that can actually live up to hype and we had it all. We had the hype. He was coming out. He was the number one recruit from high school because he was a high school, you know, record holder and things like that. Coos Bay, Oregon. Coos Bay, Oregon. He put Oregon on the map, even though Oregon was already before he got there. Bowerman had a national championship oh, program. Yeah. People don't realize that. Absolutely. That he had he had multiple Olympians. It wasn't just Steve Prefontaine that went to 76. He had multiple Olympians on that. 72. Team. He was the coach of 72. Sorry that he was the coach of. And it was interesting getting Dave Waddle's perspective on it, being one of his compatriots. And being one of the great runners of the time, I think you can hear that Waddle, you know, was kind of like, there were a lot of great guys there. Like, let's not only like, he obviously respects Steve Prefontaine, but Dave Waddle has some fire to him too. He's like, hey, I was a hell of a runner. I was a gold medalist. I, you know, I I did all these things. I beat Steve Prefontaine. But it's just, like you said, Dave, it's the what if, it's the personality. He was a larger than life personality. He did though, he was out there in front with the AAU fighting him. And helped change the sport in a lot of ways and became a martyr for what distance running can be in America. Not what it is, but what it can be because he was competitive on the world stage in the 5K where we didn't necessarily see that. And, you know, it was the what if of what if he would have eventually went up to the 10K, which he probably would have eventually went up there. What could he have done? Like, listen, he was one of the only athletes that I would emulate in practice running. And at college parties, <laughs> drinking. He just seemed like, like he had a good time. He definitely seemed like you know? he had so, a good time. Like, like listen, and he, he had the hair. You know, it was like he was he cool, was man. Larger than life guy, and again, a distance runner. That's cool. You yeah. don't find that very often. It's not a thing that to us we find distance runners cool because we like runners. To the outside world, most distance runners are, I hate to say it, guys, we're a bunch of nerdy dudes that really aren't that athletic that are just fast. And that's how a lot of people see us. But a guy like Pre, who was respected, liked, and, you know, there are stories of him just being liked by everyone on campus, football players, basketball players. Like, he was just... The ladies liked him. The ladies liked Pre, um, and he was just a cool guy. And he's someone that you wanted to be like, and now... We'll never know, but Listen, his his legacy lives on. He drove a gold MG because he because he was that guy. He, yeah, yeah, yes, he did. So everybody, I mean, there are so many guys that we left out. That, oh my god, like Jim I'm Thorpe just now, Jesse Owens. Um, even you I mean, look at all the guys that that I watched, like Steve Holman and Rich Rich Kana, and like. We even current Ryan Krauser, Amanda Dupont. Ruth Wick, uh, like, Krauser was 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 on my uh, list of guys to mention. He's on Mondo. I Mondo, mean, but, yeah, and even um the other one that competes with Krauser. What's his name? Um, Kovacs. Yeah, Kovacs, who was Krauser before Krauser. Yeah, I mean, there's just it's just. And even on the women's side, you have Sonia so Richards much, yeah. Ross. You have you know, uh, you know one of my favorites to watch, and not at the pro level, but what she did in Kentucky with Abby Steiner was just so much fun to watch what she did there. How about Faith uh, Kipiegan? 
Faith Kip Yegon. Like, yes, we can go on and on and on. And then there's even marathoners that we haven't mentioned. Uh, like, it's Paula Radcliffe and Bob Kempinen and you know, like, like all these great guys. Yeah. Yes. I mean, Mo Farah. Mo Farah. I didn't mention Mo. Galen Rupp. Galen Rupp for the Americans getting that silver was something that, you know, it just, there's just so many. And there's not enough time to mention all that. You know, even Emma Coburn, Emma Coburn being a light, a beacon of light in the steeple that Emily we haven't Eager. had. Um, Molly Huddle just do it. Like there's names upon names upon names. But these are our lists. These are who we stand by. Certainly that is- tweet at us and tell us that, that our list sucks or that you love it. By all and our means. list is subject to change, right? Because uh, as things fluid. occur, yeah. it is fluid. All time greats could be replaced. Um, you know what? And you know, the current ones that we watch could be replaced. Cause like I said, Sydney, a thing people like Abby Steiner could all eventually end up in that top all time five list. They could end up in so my could Shikari. So could Shikari. Yeah. We didn't even mention Shikari. We didn't mention Noah Lyles. We didn't like it is. And you know, and one of my favorite people to watch is, um, uh, I forget his name now. He's the one that's just always in the finals of the 400. He's Karate from Smith Island. Who is it? Karate, Karate James. James. Karate James. How is he not one of your favorite athletes to watch? You quite literally, there are three things in life that you know. There's death, there's taxes, there's Karate James in the finals of the Olympics and Worlds. This, I thought this, he was 45 years old. He's like 32. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he's he's been around. He's yeah, been going to the final legend. for damn near a decade. He's great. And he's just always in the finals. He is a former world champion. He's won a world championship. It's not like he's a slouch. But... He's just always in the finals. He never misses. The guy just knows how to compete. And, and then there's th- those other what ifs, like, you know, um, what's his face in the 800? Donovan Whatever. Brazier. Yeah. And what if Brazier. Donovan Brazier say? And you know what? There still is hope for Donovan. I was. I don't even think he's 30 yet. No, no, there still is hope for Donovan. You know, middle distance people, they don't get their careers are done probably around Probably around 32 is when you are like you're at a fully out of peak. He's got time. Donovan could still get back on that horse. I, I, he's- and then you have you have guys that are coming up. We have our Bryce Hopple. We have our buddy Clayton. Um, and, you know, we have plenty of people that we have to look forward to. And even on the international stage, Amos is still doing his thing in the 800. Right? Like there are still so many great you athletes. Do this in five years. And there's some high school kid now. Would be like, Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And, you know, and it's yeah, Listen. it is. Someone like an Ingerbitson could certainly climb up the, the, the list, you know? Like, yes. Listen, anyone could be replaced. And Jakob Ingerbritson, if we did this list next year, I guarantee Jakob Ingerbritson will break into my top five all time to watch. Faith, too, probably. Faith Kip Yegon. And if a thing and, and Sydney run more than two races, then I'll probably put them up there, too. Or if Noah keeps on winning. If Noah keeps on winning. Listen, we are in a golden era of track. Arian Knighton's, what, 19? We are in a golden era if try and Fanbola, Fan, uh, Fanbola, isn't Femke he like eighteen? Oh yes, yeah, yes. He's eighteen. Then you have Femke Bowl, who Femke. is another one who we didn't mention. Um, Delilah Muhammad, who's on the back end, but Delilah in her peak before Sydney got there was a freaking blast to watch. Um, uh, there's so many. We can go on and on and on, but unfortunately, this podcast does have to eventually come. Yeah, through. you know, and and you know what, like. I'm even having second guesses now over my, my my list, but that's my list that I put out there. And you like it or you don't. Obviously, you know we we kind of did the old layup thing with Prefontaine, but you just got to be honest. And at that time in my life, even now, like he was the man. Maybe next year we could uh, we could do something like this again, but we'll see if somebody like uh, David Verberger or there's someone else or you know would want to come on and give us a sprinter's perspective. Yeah, man. Do something like that. We can get like a sprinter to come on and give us like a top five track and field athletes from New Jersey, you know, could do that top five track. And And that's another thing I want to give a shout out to anybody. If you are not from Jersey listening to this, please, 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 please message us. Tell us who are your top coaches in the state that we should get in touch yeah, with. Let's go. Tell us your best sports, you know, track writers that we should get in touch with. If you have any connections, give them to us. Your top athletes, maybe your all-time greats from your state that we might not know about, that maybe never made it big, but are legends where you are that you know or you can get us in touch with. We want to talk to them. That's the purpose of the show. We want people to know about you, about people you know, about people from your state. So please. 
get that out there to us because we would love, 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 love to have them on. Absolutely. Yeah, that's what we want. So that will wrap up this episode of Talking in Ovals. Um, it was a little different. We didn't have our guest. We didn't do our normal thing, but I thought we brought something fun. You know, especially, you know, we try to reach the casual fans. I don't think this one's going to reach as many casuals as it would. This is right. definitely a little bit of us nerding out. But, I mean, if you love running, if you enjoy watching track, if you enjoy watching marathons, XC, and things like that, I hope you enjoyed our list. Like Dave said, tweet at us, comments, do all that stuff. If you agree, let us know. If you think we're morons, only tell Dave. Don't tell me. I'll cry. That's fine. But uh, <laughs> You can make 10 lists out of the, the uh, people that we didn't add here. Yeah. And that's fine. Yeah, you know what? We didn't include like only collegiate grades. We didn't include like, you know, and there's some people that maybe just love the college sports and will remember your college dominant people that never went and did it in pros. Like Edward Cheserick. Like an Edward Cheserick, who might be finding something that, in the marathon. marathon okay. He's, he, he ran a nice marathon. Ches had a really good premiere in the marathon. Yeah, so, yeah. but you know what I mean? But like, you know, there's so many lists that you could have and. Ours are definitely subject to a change too. So yeah, we didn't have Maddie Centrowitz on the list, and Maddie Centrowitz, one of my favorite people to watch of his tech, yeah, but not in my top five. All right, everybody, uh, if you like what you heard today, like, share, follow, subscribe, rate five stars, Spotify, and iTunes. Spread this word of mouth. Go look for us on the socials at Talking and Ovals. Dave, before we hop out of here, anything else that you want to add? Just want to thank all of our fans and wish everyone an amazing twenty twenty four. Crazy that we're already in the year 2024 almost. But uh, everyone out there, have a safe holiday and have a great year. Yep. Everyone have a safe and happy new year. We'll be back next week with the show, obviously. And um, be safe out there. Have fun. And we're out of here. Everyone, so long.